Okay, today um, what we'll talk about in this video is different ways to add alkyl groups to a benzene ring and also some ways to add other uh, different types of groups. So the first um, group that we're going to do is we are going to look at how you can add an aldehyde directly to the benzene ring. Okay. So we'll start with our benzene ring and we will need to add an aldehyde to that um, benzene ring to make what's called benzaldehyde. So we cannot, and I can't stress this enough, you might say, well, what about just doing a friedel crafts alkylation and adding then um, this aldehyde as an acyl group. The problem is this doesn't work because basically forming that acyl carbocation, that one is too unstable. You might say, well, why is it too unstable? The reason it's too unstable is because it has no other alkyl group um, as a substituent. And so what we learn about C double bond C is the same thing for C double bond O, that you need to have at least an alkyl group there to stabilize the um, carbocation. So this is unstable and so this set of reagents will not work. Now there is another method to do this which actually generates that acyl ion in situ and it is what is called the uh, gatterman coke reaction. And so the gatterman coke um, reaction requires that you take carbon monoxide, HCl, aluminum trichloride, and copper chloride, copper one chloride. And basically what this does is this generates the acyl carbocation in um, situ. So in other words, it, it creates it um, and so that it's able to add to the benzene ring. So this is really, um, there's other methods, but this is a direct reaction um, to form a benzaldehyde. So that's the only way that will work. This method over here will not work, um, but Gatterman Coke will. Now, if you want to add a benzene ring, or if you want to add an alkyl group to a benzene ring, we've already been through some of the issues about saying, well, if you want to add a straight-chained alkyl group to the benzene ring, we cannot do that in one step. You have to use aluminum trichloride and an acid chloride for that. So you end up making... the phenyl ketone and then you can use either N2H2 you can either use N2H2 um, KOH and heat or you could use zinc and mercury and HCl and heat um, at this point Maybe you want to think about, well, what's N2H2? What is that called? That is called the wolf Kishner. And the other one is Clemenson. So this is the first sort of method that we've talked about in terms of making a straight chain alkyl benzene. If you try and use 
a straight chained alkyl halide. Let's make it a butyl one butyl chloride. If we tried to do this reaction, what product would we make? Remember what would happen is the aluminum trichloride would pull the chlorine off, the hydride would shift, so we would end up actually adding the secondary carbocation to the benzene ring. So this is sort of our first introduction to adding a adding the straight chained alkyl group, but re, but it required a couple of steps. Okay. So the other reactions that we're going to talk about are first let's talk about what is called lithium cuprates which are also called Gilman reagents for I believe Henry Gilman who developed those rea those reactions so if you want to use a lithium cuprate, let's first of all talk about how you would do that. So the first thing I would do is I would add Br2 and FeBr3 to the benzene ring. Right. If you want, stop, write the product, see if you were correct. That adds a bromine. And then what I would do is then I would add lithium metal to make the organolithium compound. Now, the organolithium compound was, was um, similar to our Grignard reagents from before, but in this case we want to specifically use the lithium um, in this case. And if you make an organolithium compound, it has the same C minus. The counter ion does make a difference. One of the things that I kind of it was in the lecture notes um, for the for the um, in the Grignard section that we probably didn't talk a whole lot about was the idea that you have a C minus. A C- is a strong base. We did talk about that. But could you take that C- and add, let's say, an alkyl halide to it and do an SN2 reaction? I mean, carbon-carbon bond formation is a premium reaction. That's why we know the names Grignard, Diels, Alder, because you're forming carbon-carbon bonds. But would this work? And sadly, it doesn't work. So what Gilman f found was that if you took an organolithium reagent and you added to it a copper one iodide. What you ended up making was, um, and it could be copper iodide, it could be copper chloride. If what you would end up doing is, you would end up actually forming a complex where there were two of the C minuses and a copper one plus and a lithium one plus. Okay, and the stoichiometry for this would require that you add um, two of the benzene rings reacting. So just to balance it out, and I'm not going to balance it out from here on out, two of those would make that plus a lithium iodide or a lithium chloride, depending on what you use. So this reagent is what is called a Gilman reagent. 
or it is also called a lithium cuprate. And Grignard's or organolithium reagents on their own won't do this SN2 reaction, but a Gilman will. So we could then take our benzene ring in its Gilman form, and I know I just switched the lithium and the copper, but it's, it's irrelevant which one comes first. If you took the Gilman reagent, now you add to it any bromide, what it ends up doing is it ends up coupling so that you form the alkyl benzene. And again, stoichiometry would say that we would get that plus lithium bromide and a copper bromide. But the idea here is I can couple that alkyl group to the benzene ring. So it doesn't matter what the alkyl group is, you can use a Gilman reagent to form that. And let's say that I had a Gilman reagent and I wanted to make that same N-butyl bromide that, or that same N-butyl benzene that we talked about using two steps in the previous slide. So we wanted to make the butyl, butyl benzene, but if we used the benzene and tried to do a Friedel-Crafts alkylation, we'd end up with it being rearranged. If we do this Gilman reagent and use the Gilman reaction, it actually would do that, and we would end up forming the butyl benzene. So a Gilman reagent could be used as a substitute for the two steps of using a um, as making the acid chloride, putting it on the benzene ring with Friedel Kras acylation, and then Wolf Kishner Clemenson reduction. But the versatility of this Gilman reaction is it doesn't matter what alkyl bromide you use. It's going gonna, it's gonna to couple the benzene ring with that R group. Now, the mechanisms beyond the scope of this course, I'm not even quite sure that anybody fully understands the, the mechanistic part of this. It was suggested when I was um, graduating from graduate school, one of the people I interviewed with for a postdoc position said, you should study lithium cuprates, and I, uh, I took that under advisement and decided to go um, and study x-ray crystallography of lithium compounds instead, but actually these are what are called, uh, they're believed to be what are called SET reactions, which means that they are single electron transfer reactions, and quite honestly that involves um, radicals, and I, I wasn't interested in radical chemistry at the time. But this is a perfect way to make a straight-chained benzene because this doesn't undergo rearrangement. Okay, So you can do this with anything. So that's a useful reaction. Now, it does have a limitation. The limitation is that when we talked about Grignard's, you, could ha you had to make the Grignard with no air, no water, no alcohol, nothing, no amines, no carboxylic acids. In other words, nothing that the, uh, nothing that the Grignard could react with, including all of these, which are all base or which are all acids that the strong C minus would deprotonate. So that's the disadvantage is you have to make the grid you have to make these um, Gilman reagents in the absence of a benzene or absence of air and water and all of that. But any reaction will work with a with a Gilman. Okay. And maybe we'll come back to that.
another reaction which has is in your top hat book is what is called the heck reaction and it's also called heck coupling All right so i could make some corny joke here like what the heck is a heck reaction but i won't or maybe i just did so a heck reaction is when you take your halogenated benzene so X is still equal to probably a bromine, although it could be a chlorine, maybe even an iodine. And what you're going to do is you're going to react that with a benzene or with an alkene that has an R group on it. So what happens is, is that this requires some transition metal catalysts. And we don't really get into the real nuts and bolts of today's synthetic organic chemistry, but today's synthetic organic chemistry that's done at pharmaceutical companies, that's done in academic labs, really involves a lot of transition metal chemistry, which means you have to know inorganic chemistry and organometallic chemistry to understand those. But what HEC chemistry is, is that you use a palladium salt, and this is sometimes abbreviated OAC for acetic. Um, this is the basically the anion of acetic acid. And so this reagent is sometimes abbreviated palladium OAC2. Each one of those is negatively charged, which means the palladium is 2+. plus. So palladium acetate is used as a catalyst, palladium being the transition metal catalyst for this. And what you also then use is either as a solvent something like triethylamine, or you can also use triphenyl phosphorus. Okay, so you use palladium and either triethylamine or um, tri, uh, triphenyl, sorry, triphenyl phosphorus, which is sometimes abbreviated pH for the phenyl group and uh, P. And remember, phenyl's not like the seed. Phenyl is spelled like that. So what happens then is that the reactions, these two guys couple. Now, let me write the parts in different colors if I can do that. So what's going to happen is, is that you're going to lose the halogen. And so you're going to couple the benzene with the double bond. And so if I change the color on the double bond to something like blue, you're going to end up with something that looks like this. Okay. So you end up coupling this group to the benzene ring. And this unfortunately only really works with, um, with alkenes. And you're always going to couple the benzene to this carbon. Um, the stereochemistry of this is, uh, in this case, it makes trans. So there are probably ways to control that stereochemistry, which I'm not necessarily going to get into at this point. But that's a heck coupling. And you don't actually have to do heck coupling with a benzene ring. You could say, you know what? I have this. This is called a vanillic halide because the X is directly attached to double pond. I could react that with another alkene. I could say let's use palladium acetate and triphenylphosphine because that's just easier to draw. And what I would end up doing then is I would end up coupling this group to that group. 
So heck coupling is pretty useful. Um, the advantage of this reaction is that the solvent in this case can simply be water. And you don't get any um, more green or more environmentally friendly than using water as the solvent. So heck coupling has become popular because it's a fairly environmentally friendly way but it's also a way to put a double bond onto the benzene ring and you know the alternatives to that are pretty complicated. So the next method, a modern method to put on a benzene or put on an alkyl group on a benzene ring is what is called Suzuki coupling. So what is Suzuki coupling? Well, let's talk about how we make our precursors here in order to um, get the reaction to go. So in the case of a benzene ring, I might say, okay, here's my benzene. Again, I brominate the benzene, so X is either bromine or chlorine, most likely probably bromine. And what I'm going to add to it is an R group that is attached to a boron having two OHs. And this is called a boronic acid. It also uses a transition metal catalyst, palladium and sodium hydroxide in this case. It's also using water then as the solvent, so that makes it environmentally friendly. And what I'm going to end up doing is coupling then, in this case, the benzene ring to that R group. Then I'm going to end up with basically tri uh, tris hydroxy boron, and I'm going to end up with the sodium salt of the halogen. Okay. So that's an overall reaction of Suzuki coupling. And it, it, again, it's environmentally friendly. My only issue with this is that I need to, um, I need to give you some alternative reagents, but also um, it, it's environmentally friendly because I'm using water as the solvent. Now, the palladium itself can be either a palladium metal that is coated onto a surface of carbon. Palladium is very expensive as a transition metal, so I don't need to just throw whole chunks of palladium in there, which would be really expensive. If I could coat the, a chunk of like charcoal with palladium, that would make it better. So sometimes you'll see palladium and carbon. You'll see potassium carbonate instead of sodium hydroxide. So you might see those reagents. You might even see then the palladium um, also with the um, the triphenylphosphine um, as the sort of counter ion to that, and you would have four of those on a palladium to be able to do that reaction. So usually the reagent you see is this one. Okay. Now. How do we make this boronic acid in order to add to couple with the benzene ring? Well, we know how to do that, actually. Well, we, we, we've seen a similar reaction before. So let's just say for the sake of argument that I took a double bond and I added it to it a and this reagent. Now, you can either have the boronic acid or you could have, you could either use the boronic acid or you could also use this compound which would be called a borate ester. Okay. So if, if I react the borate ester with a double bond 
you might say, well, how do I know what the product will be? And I would say, we did this before. Only in, only in that case, what we used was we used... We use BH3. Okay. So same kind of reaction. The hydrogen is going to go to one carbon. The boron is going to go to the other. So that I'm going to add a hydrogen there. And now I'm going to have my borate ester added to the other carbon. Oh, wait, I seem to remember one other thing about this reaction. The BH3, the H and the boron add 100% cis. So they would add 100% cis. Oh, I seem to remember one other thing, too. The boron adds to the carbon that is least hindered. That was the reason why we ended up with anti-Markovnikov BH3, H2O2, adding H and OH 100%, anti-Markovnikov, and cis. Right, so I make this borate ester. Now I can take that borate ester and I can say, all right, uh, let's go ahead and add that to a benzene ring that already has a bromine on it. Let's use um, the palladium on carbon, potassium permanganate, or sorry, not potassium permanganate, potassium carbonate, and water. And now what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to end up taking my double bond or I'm going to take my benzene ring, and I'm going to end up coupling that to the cyclohexane ring. And pretty straightforward. But again, if I can make this boronic acid from a double or even a triple bond, then what I can do is then I can add that borate ester directly to the benzene ring, and add pretty complicated alkyl groups to the benzene ring. So here's another example of Suzuki coupling. Let's say that I had a terminal alkyne, and I add to it a boronic ester. What am I going to make? Remember, the boron is going to add to the least hindered carbon, 100% cis. Get that product. Now what can I do? I could treat that with bromobenzene, palladium on carbon, potassium carbonate, H2O, and now I'm going to get my benzene ring, and I'm now going to end up coupling it in the exact stereochemistry as before. So I end up adding a double bond to the benzene ring. So again, a uh, very environmentally friendly reaction, but pretty powerful. All I have to do is be able to take a double bond and convert that double bond into a, a bor boronic ester and then couple it with Suzuki coupling. Now, the other thing you could say is, can you reverse this process? 
Could you take, for instance, a benzene ring and make it the boronic ester? And you can. What I would do is I would start with the bromobenzene. I would react it with lithium metal so that I can form my organolithium compound. Treat that now with a boron that has three ester groups. Basically, this is kind of going to do an SN2 reaction on the boron. So this minus is going to come in, and one of the OR groups is going to be kicked off. We're into inorganic chemistry here, so SN2 doesn't really apply. But if I lose one of the OR groups, so lithium plus and an OR minus, counter ion, then I make my boronic ester now in the benzene ring. So now what could I do? Now I could take that and I could couple it with any alkyl group, again using Suzuki coupling conditions and I can add any group I want. And kind of the thing we have to remember about these reactions is that in modern synthesis, when people are trying to make really complicated molecules, a lot of times they have to make one part of the molecule that's really complicated in terms of having multiple functional groups and multiple stereochemistries. And then another group or another person in, in that research group might be making the other part of the molecule and so we have to have reactions where we can kind of couple those together to make the big complicated molecule that we would like to make. So a lot of times, big complicated drug molecules are actually broken up into manageable parts. And then things like Suzuki coupling or HEC coupling are used to put those molecules together to make those really complicated type of molecules. Okay, so those are... Um, three ways to add alkyl groups to a benzene ring. Suzuki, Heck, and Gilman. So looking at some other potential benzene reactions, let's talk about phenol. Phenol is when you have an OH group attached to the benzene ring. Now phenols are more acidic than a normal alcohol would be. You can deprotonate an alcohol with sodium hydroxide. And you can make what's called a phenoxide. Just for comparison, a normal alcohol plus NaOH, and this goes back to our review from the beginning of the semester, at best you would have an equilibrium between the alkoxide and um, water. So phenoxides are a little bit more acidic. Um, one of the things we can do with, phen with a phenol, sorry, phenols are more acidic. Phenoxides are their counter, -ion or their their conjugate base. One of the things we can do with a phenol is that we can add carboxylic acids to them in the presence of acid. What kind of reaction is this? It turns out that that reaction is a Fischer esterification, which you should know because we're still working through that in lab. And so you can add that group to the benzene ring that way. 
Another way to do this reaction without the equilibrium, actually, is to take your phenol and react it with a carboxylic acid chloride. Yes, the same carboxylic acid chloride that we used in Friedel Crafts. But the advantage here is that this is a 100% reaction. So that what we end up doing is we end up forming the ester, but we don't have to worry about the annoying equilibrium that Fischer esterification provides. So like we had the reflux sat for an hour and a half, um, using an acid chloride, the reaction would have gone much, much, much quicker. Now let's turn our attention back to phenoxides for a minute. And it's always a good time for review. So I make a phenol. I would like to form a phenoxide 100% reaction. What bases can I use to make the phenoxide? H minus, C minus, N minus, and I can also use hydroxide. Hello. Hello. Okay. Let me go back to the slide presentation. If this, was a if this was a professional operation, what I would have done is I would go back when I'm editing this and I would edit that part out. My sister's calling me, trying to tell me what's going on in her, um, her neck of the woods. But I'm not even going to try and do that. Okay, so phenoxides. So we can use an H minus, C minus, N minus, or OH minus to make a phenoxide. What can I do with that phenoxide? I can take that phenoxide and I could react it with a primary halide or a secondary halide. What kind of reaction would I get? If you said SN2, you're correct. If you said a Williamson ether synthesis, you would be even more correct. So, note that this sequence allows me to put an O. Our group on the benzene ring. Now, if I gave you a synthesis problem, and we'll talk about that on Friday, we'll talk about, um, for Friday's video, we're going to talk about all the different types of synthesis problems you can do. If you need to add an OR group to the benzene ring, notice the steps you have to take. You have to make the phenol, deprotonate it to form the phenoxide, and then react it with a primary or secondary halide. I guess at this point I'm obligated to ask what would happen if you reacted it with a tertiary re with a tertiary halide. Hopefully you would say an E2 reaction so that I would get the alkene and the phenol. Again, we did this with Williamson ether synthesis. But, all right, how many steps did it take me to get from benzene to the phenol? Uh, let's count the steps. Nitro Amine, I'm going to have to go off to the side here.
diazonium, phenol. If I was smart, I would put this on the quiz to say what reagents would you use to give me these, to do these four steps. At this point, still trying to get used to all of this, a little freaked out by maybe all the rumor mill that's going to happen in the next couple of days. So instead of that, let me let stop the tape. What reagents would you use to accomplish these four steps? And when you got them, come back. We'll see if you were right. All right, you're back. HNO3, H2SO4. Fe or Sn, HCl, heat, Na, NO2, HCl to form the diazonium, H3O plus to add the OH group. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six steps to put an OR group on the ring. Will you have to put our OR groups on a ring? Yes. How many steps will it take you? Six. So this is a sequence to add an OR group. Okay, so that's, phen that's phenols and phenoxides. Now, there is a specific reaction of phenol that is very useful. And that is to take the phenol and react it with carbon dioxide and sodium hydroxide. Okay. So let's think about what happens in this reaction. Well, the hydroxide is going to deprotonate the phenol and the phenol is going to form the phenoxide. Now what's going to happen with the CO2? Well, the CO2 looks like this. And so what happens is that you could move this pair of electrons down here, move this pair of electrons out to the carbon and actually use that carbon as a C- minus to attack the carbon dioxide and then move the pair of electrons down to the oxygen. So, what I'm kind of saying here is that you're going to use that, and then that's what's going to react with the carbon dioxide. Hmm. That looks kind of like what an R- minus would do to CO2. Hmm. That's what a Grignard reaction did with CO2. And so what, did, what do we end up doing? We end up basically forming C double bond O, O minus. Now, is that molecule happy? Yeah, no, not very happy. Why? No, benz no aromatic ring. So how about it just does this? Let's lose the H+. Plus. Let's take that pair of electrons. Oh, I'm violating my rule here. Lose the H+, plus, move that pair of electrons to reform the benzene ring, and move that pair of electrons up to the, OMA, to the C double bond O. I'll regenerate the benzene ring, which will make the molecule very happy. And... Then I'll have my, still have my carb, deprotonated carboxylic acid. Now I go ahead and add H plus to that. And what do I end up forming? I end up forming an OH, a C double bond OH if you're concerned. Let's just call that excess H plus. Why is that important? This molecule is called salicylic acid.
Why is salicylic acid important? Well, back in the day, people found that if they had a headache, they could chew on um, birch tree bark. Uh, birch tree bark, I, I bet, is not very tasty, but it will help you. Um, it'll help your headache. But it's a little rough on your stomach. It kind of eats away at the lining of your stomach. So what they do with the acido or what they do with salicylic acid is they go ahead and they can react it with and I'm going to go ahead and use this reagent because that's acetic anhydride that we used in lab. And what happens then is the acetic anhydride reacts with the OH and it'll end up forming the ester. So I, I could have said here, I could have said, well, let's just react this with acetic acid and um, H+. Plus. I could have done a Fischer esterification here. But the reality is everybody would use acetic anhydride so that I can make now acetyl salicylic acid. What is that? That's aspirin. So we went from chewing on tree bark and destroying our stomachs to using aspirin, which in excess probably still destroys your stomach, but it's far less, um, has that less drawback than the salicylic acid. So if you don't have enough birch tree bark around to isolate enough salicylic acid, this whole procedure would be a good industrial preparation of salicylic acid. And it also kind of gives you an idea of it helps us review what happens when you take a granular and react it with CO2. You get a carboxylate that then you, depro you protonate to form the carboxylic acid. So that reaction is uh, a useful one. Okay, now we're going to completely, in the last part here, we're going to completely change focuses. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a benzene ring with a chlorine and a couple of strategically placed nitro groups. And we're going to react that. Let's start by reacting it with something like sodium hydroxide and probably a lot of heat. Well, actually, no, I'm going to take the heat away. So this is what is going to call, be called electrophilic aromatic substitution. Wait, no, that's not electrophilic aromatic substitution. I've got a nucleophile. Oh, better erase that. It's nucleophilic. Aromatic substitution. How does that work? Well, first of all, the mechanism I'm going to show you is for an activated ring. But wait, you might say, NO2 groups are deactivating. Yes, in electrophilic aromatic substitution. Deactivating groups become activating groups when you go to nucleophilic and aromatic substitution. So in this case, what's going to happen is I've got a completely different mechanism. My OH- is going to come in. It's going to attack that chlorine. And then that pair of electrons is going to go next to the nitro group. So I'm going to end up with a Cl, an OH, a negative charge next to the N plus of the double bond oxygen and of the O minus. And I still have an 
N plus double bond O, O minus down here. What purpose are the nitro groups playing? Well, they're actually stabilizing this intermediate. How? Well, number one, number one I could take this pair of electrons, move it here, move that pair of electrons up to the O minus. So here is resonance structure numero uno. Okay, that's great. But what if this pair of electrons decided to basically come down and form a double bond and this pair of electrons, let me get the arrow right, this pair of electrons would go to that carbon. I would get a, a third resonance structure. Now the minus charge would be sitting next to the other nitro group. And what would it do? It could move here. A pair of electrons could go to the oxygen. Oh, forgot my double bond there. So I'd end up with a fourth resonance structure. Why are the nitro groups activating? Because they're causing this reaction to go quickly by activating the ring. How are they activating the ring? Because the negative charge is moved next to the nitro group, which allows the nitro group to basically stabilize it by resonance. So this reaction doesn't require heat it would go relatively straightforwardly so that you would have the, in the end, what happens is, I'm going to have to rewrite, I'm going to rewrite the original structure down here. The original first carbocation. Oh, sorry. We're now working with carbanions. So let me just go ahead and write two NO2 groups here. Negative charge there. The negative charge will go here. Which is a better leaving group, chlorine or hydroxide? Chlorine. Chlorine gets kicked off. Reform the double bond. Now you got an OH. Nucleophilic aromatic substitution. What am I replacing the chlorine with? I'm replacing chlorine with an OH. So that is what is called activated nucleophilic aromatic substitution. And it's pretty straightforward. And typically if it's done, it's done with a nitro group. So here's gonna be here's gonna be the final reaction of the day. All right, everybody's like, you great. I'm going to go nuts here in the bunker if I get locked down. But what happens if you don't have those nitro groups on the ring? What if I said, oh, I have a non-activated ring. Let me treat this with hydroxide at a casual 350 degrees Celsius. I can substitute the OH for the CH3. However, when people did this reaction, number one, they got it to go, but it took 350 degrees. They ended up with the OH adding in the position they expected. Then they also ended up with the 
OH in a position they didn't expect. So then, you know, when you do that, you got to say, oh, well, my mechanism has to be consistent with that, has to be consistent with that, um, those two products. So what happens? Here's what happens. What happens is, is that under that amount of heat, the OH, the H on the benzene ring, wait, let's not, let's write a benzene ring without five bonds, please. That hydro, that H gets removed. That's going to take a lot of heat. So I'm going to end up with a negative charge next to my chlorine. What then happens is the pair of electrons moves here and Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Again, professional operation would go back and would go back and actually edit this part of the tape out, but here's the correct so the H is going to be removed to form that minus charge with the double bond. That pair of electrons is then going to move and kick the chlorine out. I'm going to form what is called a benzene. Now, the benzene has a lot of issues. Number one, 180 degree SP geometry in a six-membered ring, it's going to be incredibly unstable, which means it's going to be incredibly reactive. So what happens then is the following. Hydroxide can come in, add to this carbon, and then the pair of electrons from the triple bond goes to that carbon. So now I ended up adding the H there. I ended up putting a minus charge back on that carbon. And then what happens is if water is present, which it has to be for hydroxide, this then simply deprotonates the water. And we get the product that we expected. However, go back to our benzene intermediate. What's stopping the OH minus from adding to that carbon and doing the opposite? Nothing. So now the hydroxide added meta, and now that minus will end up deprotonating the water. And the mysterious benzene intermediate is responsible for both of these products being formed. And today that's the accepted mechanism for non-activated nucleophilic aromatic substitution. And my time is up. Okay, so I will, so I've, well, by the time I post this onto the Canvas site, the reading assignment will be there, um, the online quiz will be there, and then you can go ahead and there are some practice, couple sets of practice problems for you to try. Any questions, Piazza, our 8 a.m., 1 p.m. class, um, class, online class uh, sessions, or email me directly or make an appointment through the youcanbook.me site.